My name is uh, Charlotte van Ooyen, and on behalf of, of the Brussels-based think tank, the Lisbon Council, I have the pleasure of being your host this morning for this important discussion that puts the spotlight on a group of potentially very impactful open data reusers. I'm talking about public institutions. So wonderful things are happening thanks to data reusers from the sector across Europe. Now, let me take you on a very quick trip. Did you know that the Irish government's chief information office created a portal where your money goes, where they offer data-driven visualizations and insights on government expenditures, uh, tapping into open data coming from across the Irish public sector, to uh, not only give well transparency to the data, but real insights to citizens over multiple years on where uh, their tax money is spent. Well, now looking at uh, a regional level, let's go to Spain, where uh, the energy hub of the Junta de Castilla y León uh, publishes information on its energy supplies to promote energy savings and efficiency in its facilities. And this energy data hub has saved more than 12 million euros in fixed electricity costs in the meantime. So this is a, a highly successful uh, open data initiative developed by the public sector itself. Now, looking at the European level, uh, there are also multiple initiatives which can be mentioned. For example, uh, the European Commission has an agri-food data portal that facilitates monitoring and evaluation of agricultural policies, drawing on data from multiple European institutions. So what do all these examples have in common? They are about public institutions developing services based on data produced by public institutions. Well, in today's uh, webinar, um, we would like to explore this uh, type of open data reuse in more detail and talk about how we can make sure that more data become available that are relevant to public servants who wish to innovate, uh, who wish to innovate uh, public services and that they find the support they need to do so. Now, why does the Data.Europa Academy dedicate a webinar to this specific topic? That is because the potential value for citizens is enormous and this is still an underutilized potential because more attention has gone out to other users of open data, such as data driven businesses and civil society organizations, which are, of course, also very valuable. So uh, today, let's look together at this specific group of open data reusers that find themselves in public institutions at all levels of government ranging from municipalities to ministries to EU agencies. Many of you are here today and we would love to hear from you. So together um, we would like to well, gain some more insight into the value of data reuse uh, within the public sector, learn about different approaches to measure the data demands from public institutions, and strengthen the understanding of a demand-driven approach to data publication. Furthermore, uh, we would like to reflect on how data.europa.eu can support data providers in taking on board public institutions' data demands. What does our program uh, look like today? Uh, I, I will kick off first with an, uh, a broader introduction after which we will talk about some uh, best practices with expert speakers who I will introduce to you uh, shortly. Uh, then we will have a short break after which we will have an interactive discussion uh, with all of you and we will finalize with a recap and next steps. Now you see that um, the program is rather flexible in timing and uh, this is because today is about having a discussion with you 
on your needs uh, so you can do what you do best, which is make open data success. In this case, also for the public sector itself. So how can you make yourselves heard? From now on, you can post uh, your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, and following the presentations, I may call on you to unmute, briefly present yourself and ask your question and also remute. Uh, as will become clear in the course of this webinar, your input is essential to help the data.europa Academy and portal support the work that you are doing in your countries and European institutions. So I really want to encourage you to express yourselves. Even if not all questions are addressed today, they will be taken on board in the future activities of data.europa.eu. Now, many of you will be able to uh, also use the reactions menu at the top of your screen to express your appreciation or perhaps surprise for certain statements made by the presenters today. So please go ahead during the webinar to, to use these functionalities. And at some point, uh, I will also ask you some uh, yes or no questions for which you can use the raise hand function uh, to answer, which you will equally find in the reactions menu if you connect it through the Teams app. And it, you will find it next to the chat button at the bottom of your screen if you have joined us on the web. Uh, furthermore, I would like to mention that the webinar organization will record the session and make the slides and recording available on the data.europa Academy website. Now, uh, before uh, going ahead with the, the broader uh, introduction presentation from my side, I would like to take a moment to uh, present uh, our distinguished speakers that we have today. So first of all, uh, we have Frederica Velledonker, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Urbanism, Faculty of Architecture of Delft University of Technology. She is a researcher attached to the Open Data Knowledge Center there. And her research focuses on governance of open data and specifically economic, organizational and legal aspects of open data infrastructures. Currently, she participates in three international research projects focusing on the development of open data ecosystems and on the promotion and strengthening of active learning and teaching towards open spatial data infrastructures. She's also the co-author of a report on open data reusers for the Dutch government. Now, Frederica, uh, quickly going to you, please tell us about your hopes and expectations for today's webinar. Thank you very much um, for this kind introduction. My hopes and expectations will, as I said, my hopes and expectations are to get a better insight as to what actually the public sector wants, because most of my research has always been focused from a, a user perspective. And I've talked to a lot of reusers from the, the private sector, from small companies to large companies. but and I've also talked a lot to people from the, the public sector, but I've never really had a sort of like a, a, um, a, a proper overview of what their needs are. I, I know it fairly well in the Netherlands, but I'm very interested to see what's happening in the rest of Europe. So that's my expectations. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Frederica. Now over to uh, Antonin Garon, um, who works at Etalab the French task force for data policy, including open data. As a product owner of the national portal data.gov.fr, his main goal is to help define the product vision and prioritize the different functionalities required. To that end, he represents the voice of the users and is the interface between the design and technical teams. Previously, he worked at beta.gov.fr the digital services incubator within the French Prime Minister Talk Task Force for Modernization and the Agence Française de Développement on the issue of e-government. Uh, Antonin, I have the same question to you. Please tell us about your hopes and expectations for today's webinar. 
Hello everyone, uh, thank you for this introduction and thank you all also for having me. I beg your pardon for my uh, rusty English. I'll do my best uh, for this presentation today. I'll say my hopes and expectation is to learn more about the best practice you identified within Europe and within our counterparts. Uh, I think it is indeed a very important subject and there are uh, a lot of misconception, I think, on open data where there is this phantasm that open data is made for startup or big companies, but uh, we, uh, at least in France, uh, we realize that the, the first users of uh, open data are in fact public bodies. So it's a, it's a very important issue to tackle and um, I'm very glad that uh, we can have a question and exchange on the subject. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Antonia. Now, before going over to your presentations, I would like to uh, to take everyone here on a on a journey uh, through an introduction to the data reuse in the public sector and measuring demand. Um, now this introduction, uh, it's based on uh, the highlights of a discussion paper which was published last month. Uh, and it, this discussion paper has been shared with all participants, but is also available on the data.europa academy. And it's about measuring data demands within the public sector. Uh, today I will only be able to, to skip some highlights and I hope to pique your curiosity, of course, to read the full paper. Um, then we will pair the insights from the paper with uh, some input that we already got from uh, many of you in the registration process, because those of you who registered through the Academy uh, filled out uh, a mini survey giving us some insights uh, into uh, the extent to which you are already working on this topic of data reuse within the public sector. Now, um, when talking about uh, data reuse in the, in the public sector, uh, what can it uh, serve uh, for? Uh, in, in broad lines, we can say that it can uh, strengthen uh, the public sector in three ways. So first of all, it can help the public sector to become stronger in looking to the future and uh, adapting policies as such. So this is what we call anticipatory government. So this is using uh, data, open data, but also other types of data to predict trends and pa patterns, uh, mitigate emerging risks, uh, for example, uh, in emergency uh, situations, and also to better respond to uh, developing crises. Uh, an example of this is the European Statistical Recovery Dashboard developed by uh, Eurostat, which uh, serves to uh, will better understand the, the, the consequences of the global health crisis and anticipate also the economic uh, and social impact of that. Um, the second area in which open data is important for the public sector is in the area of design and delivery, because it will help better understand uh, the problems that we want to deal with in uh, policies, uh, helps to engage uh, with the public better meet citizens' needs and also serve as a basis for evidence-based policy. Uh, for example, in the Baltic Sea region, uh, open data serves uh, in uh, cross-border welfare services because it helps uh, different agencies collaborate better together in the interest of the end user who shouldn't be bothered uh, with uh, the well, the functionalities of the different agencies, but just wants to have the services that he or she needs uh, as a, as a cross-border worker. Now, thirdly, uh, we have the area of performance management uh, where open data can help uh, to increase public sector productivity, 
uh, have a more efficient use of resources and also serve in the evaluation of policies and impact. Here I can mention uh, the open address data in Denmark, which led to an improved government backend uh, capabilities, more efficient service delivery and improved response accuracy for the emergency services. So not only can services and policies become more efficient uh, and this affects the public sector's financial bottom line, they may also become more sustainable, inclusive and trustworthy and thus benefit citizens directly. However, despite this well, great potential, uh, it has been largely underused and this has to do with uh, a historic focus on economic value creation when it comes to open data. Of course, in the first phase of open data, it was mainly about uh, transparency, simply getting uh, the data out there. But when thinking about uh, end users uh, came into place, uh, this mainly concerned uh, business users. So um, the, the, the public sector itself as the end user was not very much in sight. At the same time, uh, there's also a wrong assumption that data will flow freely in the public sector uh, in any case, uh, which, uh, well, uh, as you know from working in the public sector, uh, is not uh, true at all. And uh, finally, there is a, a lack of a drive to really scale up uh, the, the great best practices uh, that are out there. So there is a strategic uh, impetus needed uh, for this. So uh, that's what we want to, to give to you in this webinar today. There is a strong need to consider a public institutions as data reusers from the outset of the data publication process in order to enable uh, the, the large scale reuse by uh, this group of users. Now, with this background, uh, we had a couple of research questions in mind uh, that we uh, looked at in our discussion paper. Uh, we wanted to know, uh, I think I hear a little bit of sound, so perhaps not everyone is muted on the call. Just a quick request to please mute yourselves. Um, so in our discussion paper, we decided to look at what is already being done in Europe when it comes to looking at the needs of public institutions as data reusers. So what approaches and indicators do already uh, exist? So we wanted to look at uh, academic literature, uh, but also policy literature to find out about uh, interesting case studies. And we equally examined international uh, open data measurement frameworks to learn about relevant indicators uh, measuring the demand from the public institution side. Um, now we've been talking about public institutions data demands, but what is it really? Uh, now, throughout the research, uh, we determined that it's a, a combination of multiple things. Uh, it has to do with uh, the, the popularity of data sets that are already out there, um, interest in uh, new data categories or existing ones. Uh, also, uh, data demand is about requirements that users can have regarding uh, the usability of data certain uh, quality requirements, for example, uh, update frequency, metadata standardization requirements, and also uh, the needs that they have in terms of uh, the support to be able to reuse uh, the data, for example, through visualization tools or feedback mechanisms on the portal. And all of these, uh, which are specific to data-driven applications in the public sector, since we're talking about public institutions, data demand. Now, what did we find when looking at approaches by uh, member states? So member states, they uh, have mechanisms to foster the data demand in general, but 
not much can be said on what data demand and reuse related data they actually uh, collect or how these are uh, analyzed and uh, evaluated. So uh, we see that there are activities on awareness uh, for open data. There are consultations regarding data publication, but not so much on the kind of supports that public sector reusers uh, would need. Um, in, in the Netherlands, data communities, for example, uh, have been installed for this purpose to enable a dialogue between data providers and data reusers. And uh, besides community engagement, uh, certain member states have also conducted uh, user research, for example, through surveys uh, and interviews in France. I'm sure Antonin will tell us some more about that later on and portal uh, features themselves can help to know what the demand is from public sector uh, users. For example, in Ireland, they developed a rating uh, system for certain uh, data sets, indicating well, the popularity uh, of, the, of the data set. But what do all these approaches have in common? They uh, generally well, foster the data demand, but they, they rarely really measure what this uh, demand is. And they are uh, often aimed at um, the general reusers and not public institutions specifically. Now, when looking at what EU institutions uh, do in this area, uh, there was very little public evidence uh, available, which uh, led us to, to wonder, perhaps it's underdocumented because we did get a lot of signs that interesting things uh, are happening. Um, there is one exception, uh, an analytical report, which came out from the European uh, data portal a couple of years ago. Uh, about understanding supply and demand on the European data portal, so the predecessor of data.europa.eu. And even though it's, it considers reusers in general and not public sector uh, reusers uh, specifically, it does uh, demonstrate the value of web analytics tools to collect data on the demand. Uh, of certain categories of data sets and also analyze changes over time. So this is a very uh, relevant development already happening. Now, when looking at international open data measurement uh, frameworks, uh, we looked at seven of them and found that uh, the three mentioned on the left solely focus on open data supply. So uh, the World Wide Web Foundation's Open Data uh, Barometer, uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation's Global Open Data Index, and the Open Data Watch's uh, Open Data Inventory are all about measuring the extent to which data have actually been opened up and don't really tell us much about uh, well, the demand side. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, four measurement frameworks which do include some indicators related to demand. So it says plus demand. They also measure uh, aspects of uh, supply because it, of course it is in, uh, important to have a holistic vision in order to be able to connect uh, supply and uh, demand. Um, and uh, yes, what I also wanted to mention, the two, supply, two of the supply indicators are no longer uh, in existence. And uh, the first one, the Open Data Barometer, actually has led to the development of the Global uh, Data Barometer, which gives a broader uh, vision, so not only on open data, but data in uh, general. Now, looking at these four uh, measurement frameworks, which do include some uh, demand focused uh, indicators, um, we have established which uh, dimensions in these uh, measurement frameworks include some demand focused indicators. But it should be mentioned that in general, 
they don't specifically mention uh, measure demand from the public sector side, but the indicators that are included have the potential to be adapted to do so. So, so this might be interesting for data.europa.eu to uh, when developing indicators to measure public institutions data demand to take such indicators uh, as a starting point. Uh, just mentioning an example from the global data uh, barometer. They have one metric where they say there are clearly documented processes for soliciting and integrating feedback from external users to improve data quality and respondents uh, indicate uh, to what extent this is the case. Now, obviously, such indicator could be adapted to look at uh, open data reuse from the public sector specifically. Now, this is um, yeah, what we know from academic and policy literature, but now we would like to also, uh, well, look at what we learned uh, from you through our uh, mini survey. So uh, as you can see, we have uh, mostly uh, participants from, uh, from member states at the central and uh, federal level. Uh, also a large part from you come from the regional and local level, quite some university participants uh, and uh, also some of you registered from an EU institution, agency or body. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned at the start, not all of you uh, received this, uh, this mini survey at the start. Those of you registered through the EU learning platform didn't. So uh, I would like to ask those of you who registered through the EU learning platform to please uh, raise your hand so I know how many of you are here uh, today. So I see at least 13 additional people. This uh, should uh, enlarge the, the, the gray area a, a little bit here. Okay. Thank you. So yes, you can uh, lower your hands uh, again. Then uh, we had asked you to uh, whether you had given thought to data reusers from public institutions prior to this webinar. Um, now, uh, the good news is that most of you, uh, most of you had. Um, oh, in the meantime, I see that we have over uh, 67 uh, hands raised. So we have uh, we've quite some attendance from the EU institutions uh, today. So very good. Please all lower your hands uh, again. Um, so data reuses from public institutions uh, prior to this, uh, this webinar at the regional and local level. Uh, many of you had already uh, given this uh, some thought and the same uh, from the central uh, and federal level. Uh, could I please have uh, some raised hands again from those participants uh, who registered through the learning platform? If you had given thought to this group of reusers prior to the webinar. I see at least two, three. That's good, but uh, that also shows that, uh, that it's a good thing that we, we organize uh, today's webinar. So to, to give some attention to this, uh, to this topic here today. 
Now, when asking you about uh, some issues or uh, questions that may have come up in your organization in relation to this data reuser group, we see that there was a large uh, array of issues. Uh, but when looking at these, um, these are quite familiar issues also known in relation to other uh, reuser uh, groups. And it should be noted that a couple of them were mentioned uh, more than once, uh, mainly on data quality issues, uh, some con concerns about the legal framework for sharing and reuse data, and also uh, technical aspects uh, are of uh, concern to multiple uh, respondents in relation to this reuser group. Now, um, we also asked you if your organization has undertaken activities to assess the demand of data reusers uh, from the public sector, and if so, through what means. Um, so we see that uh, several of the respondents use portal statistics uh, to, this, uh, to this purpose, um, also undertaking or commissioning user research uh, and uh, some have organized workshops or conferences to this effect but it should mainly be noted that um, the majority of uh, people attending today has not undertaken uh, any activities to assess the demand of this uh, reuser group so there is still some work to be done here then when uh, asking about specific experiences with uh, the data reusers group uh, for those who responded that they had some experience uh, with this uh, a couple of issues uh, were highlighted uh, that it often um, you, you deal with sensitive data of course uh, yeah this can be an issue how do you aggregate it how do you anonymize it how can you share it uh, in a way that is useful uh, then for broader policy purposes without um, infringing privacy rights uh, unnecessarily. Um, then there was also a remark that there was little public sector reuse uh, at all. Um, another respondent pointed out that data skills uh, of public sector reusers are usually lower than those in the private sector. So this may also explain a somewhat lower uh, uptake of open data reuse in this uh, group. Someone else said that they didn't see any difference with other reuser uh, groups. Um, and uh, well, furthermore, some, some more familiar issues on data quality and interoperability uh, came up. And also that uh, the data needs in the public sector are quite uh, dynamic so that the public sector relies on uh, well updated uh, data and that they require good APIs to uh, have access to these data. Um, now looking at the other uh, side we also asked you if your organization ever acted as an open data reuser. Um, the majority uh, of people clearly has not. Uh, the, the best equilibrium we find here is uh, at the, the central or federal level of government. Um, and here again, I would like to uh, look at the, the audience uh, today, mainly the EU institutions in the audience. If you can please raise your hand if you have ever or your organization has ever acted as an open data reuser, to your knowledge. Please go ahead. So it seems, at least in the audience today, that uh, you institutions um, don't have a large track record when it comes to reusing uh, open data. Now looking at some uh, examples of open data reuse uh, that you mentioned us through the uh, mini survey, 
uh, we have seen that Eurostat was often uh, mentioned uh, as a great source, especially by uh, EU agencies uh, and bodies. And um, I would like to, to highlight a couple of uh, examples. So, for example, uh, the municipality of uh, Barcelona, they mentioned using data from Eurostat uh, to provide better accuracy when analyzing aggregated citizen profiles or to make comparisons among cities. Then we also had some input from the Committee of the Regions who mentioned using uh, data at the regional level from Eurostat for the legislative process at the Committee of the Regions. So, um, yeah, as you can see, the, the data types uh, well used uh, by you are quite uh, diverse, as are uh, the different sources. So we see that European data sources are quite popular among uh, the participants at today's uh, webinar. Now, coming uh, to conclusion related to the research that we did in the discussion paper and also some of the insights uh, that we got through the, the mini survey uh, today. So we've seen quite feeble evidence in uh, the literature of existing approaches and indicators developed by EU institutions, agencies and bodies and member states to assess public institutions open data demands. Um, and this is very probably mainly due to it's not being well documented uh, and published yet. However, the available evidence does suggest that uh, the initiatives are aimed at fostering uh, the data demands rather than measuring and are aimed at the data reusers as a homogeneous group and not the public sector reusers specifically. So this is also mirrored in uh, the results from the mini survey. So um, this actually really shows that there is a strong need to exchange best practices, facilitate the discussion and mutual learning uh, between the authorities responsible for managing a European and national open data portals and the data providers and reusers in the EU, national, regional and local public institutions. So to, well, to jointly talk about uh, appropriate methods and indicators to measure and foster the public institutions uh, data demand and thereby bridge the gap between data supply and uh, data demand. Finally, we um, identified some, some key, key questions that uh, are worth uh, discussing uh, with you and I'm sure we will refer to them later on after the um, presentations of our expert speakers. So, I would now uh, very much like to invite uh, Frederike to, to take the floor and uh, tell us more about the, the Dutch experience uh, regarding uh, open data reuse uh, in the public sector and also the insights that you gathered through the various uh, international research projects uh, that you did. Please go ahead, Frederike. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, yes. Oh, thank good, you. because this is set up. Uh, as soon as I open my presentation, I lose uh, what what's happening within the uh, the Teams meeting. I'll just do a very quick um, overview. Um, as I said, what you can expect in this meeting uh, is, is a very quick overview of the research we carried out in 2019 for the Dutch Ministry of the Interior. And I also mentioned some developments since then, which are not as structured as yet. And when we talk about open data in the Netherlands, we've had open data in the Netherlands by policy from, 10, uh, from uh, uh, 2011 onwards. Um, at that stage, we had three ministries who were uh, responsible for open data from different perspectives. For the last four years, it's been concentrated around the Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom Relations. Um, what we also see in the Netherlands that we have many open data portals, both on the national level 
uh, either for uh, domain specific data or for general data, but we also have a lot of local governments having um, their own open data portal. And the ministry had indications that open data was being reused on a large scale, but they had no idea by whom and for which goal. So they wanted to get some insights into that. So when we did the research for them, we posted four research questions. Who are the open data reusers? Can we categorize them? Are there any interrelationships? How is open data used? Which search strategies do users use? Um, which data sets do they prefer? Which barriers do they encounter? But also, do they have any suggestions to improve the um, uh, over to overcome these barriers and what are the needs of open data reuses and we looked at it both in terms from accessibility as well as from data quality perspective so the research methodology we used well um, we used the first of all an, a quantitative analysis of ip log file numbers and we picked uh, three portals, Statline, which is the um, Statistics Netherlands open data portal. We picked PDOK, which is the open data portal for geodata. And we also looked at data.overhack.nl, which is a data catalog service for open government data. So it should be mentioned that the first two are actually data platforms. The last is a data catalog service, so there is a difference. We also used a qualitative approach where we uh, first did a, posted an online questionnaire, uh, which we posted via social media. We also organized a research with TU Delft researchers. And after we've done the qualitative, the, sorry, the quantitative analysis, we picked out some reusers to interview them and we did some validation. We also did a qualitative analysis of tweets related to open data sentiments. Uh, I won't mention much about it because that, although we've used that methodology in the past, that proved not to be so useful anymore. Um, when we look at the different types of reusers, uh, not surprisingly, we found commercial and non-commercial uh, uh, reusers. We, for categories, we used the the categories that are used by Statistics Netherlands, micro enterprises, small to medium large enterprises. And the, for not-for-profit organizations, we divided them into government or organizations, NGOs, uh, research education um, institutes. And we also found a group that we classified as concerned citizens. They are very active citizens um, who use open data to uh, ask questions. When we did the, uh, the log file analysis, um, uh, actually, not surprisingly, most users were from the public sector. Um, this is, uh, we found this in previous research as well, that it was about 50-50. Um, we actually found more public sector reusers than private sector reusers. Um, but uh, what we also found, strangely enough, is that for Statistics Netherlands, about a quarter of the users actually originated from outside the Netherlands, which was surprising to us. Whereas for PDOK, which is a geo portal, most of the users were from the Netherlands. Um, and also PDOK data more often used, reused for commercial goals than statistic data. Um, and as data.overhead, .nl is a catalog service, it was not so surprising that its usage is much, much lower. That's basically because when you're looking at the number of hits, of course, if you're reusing, you're hitting multiple times, whereas with the catalog service, you often only hit once, get the data you want, and then click through the portal that you need. Um, when we looked at the top users um, of, of uh, data, for statistic data, it was mainly the Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, an organization called Baten Lassendienst Logius and Taxation Department. Uh, when we looked at the PDOK, again, it was Baten Lassendienst Logius, Ministry of Justice, uh, Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Economic Affairs, and for data.overheid.nl, uh, Cadaster, Ministry of Transport, uh, and again, the Baten Lassendienst Logius, and also uh, quite a lot of municipalities. 
Um, when we look at the most popular statistic data sets, there were different demographic data sets on municipal level, and for PDOK, it was mainly the key register uh, geodata sets that were most popular, which is the base register for addresses in uh, buildings and also the topographic map. But again, it's because they're quite often used as a layer in other services, so you get a, a bit of a, a skewed view. Um, very quickly, just as an example, just to show you the number of users that were using PDOK data, this is just to, to indicate that we're talking about millions. This is over one month. Uh, we're talking about millions of hits. Um, and as you can see, the, the, the column on the left is the, uh, the, the top 10, uh, the, the topographic map. Um, we also looked at C, um, which users use which platforms and uh, I won't explain to you which users are which, but what you can see is that some use all three platforms like the BART and Last and Dienst Logius, but other users have a preference for one portal and then click through to another portal. So this was interesting to us. As I said, this the Twitter uh, analysis. Ten years ago, Twitter was used to post comments or ask questions, and often the tweet was far more effective to get a reaction from data providers than sending an email. Uh, but there are now so many more social media channels that Twitter is no longer used other than for announcing new products. And uh, we don't have access to the data of other social media, so we cannot analyze them. Um, when we did the interviews with reusers, um, we uh, selected 20 reusers after we did an analysis of news items and 12 of them uh, we actually invited to be interviewed because we wanted to get an equal division between small users, large users, NGOs, the concerned citizens uh, and knowledge institutes. We wanted to get an even spread. So <clears throat> what we found is that not surprisingly open data are reused for commercial and for non-commercial purposes but what was surprising is that not all of the commercial companies limit themselves to only commercial applications they also produce uh, services for societal purposes and that the non-commercial organizations the ngos also create for profit applications basically because they have to um, pay for their own uh, upkeeping, so they have to also produce some uh, for-profit applications. Um, and what we also found surprisingly is that, <coughs> excuse me, there were quite a number of public servants who actually develop apps in their spare time because they uh, encounter gaps in, 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 in their working life. So they used the, the, their own free time to actually fill those gaps. Um, when we looked at the strategies that were used, um, again, we found that public sector users were often more aware of who actually the actual data holders were. So they were um, more, they tended to contact the data holders more directly rather than using a platform or a portal or a data catalog service, where the, whereas people coming in from the outside, so the private sector citizens, they tend to use the portals and the platforms if they can't find it through Google or their own network. Um, and uh, I should also mention there is uh, one or two commercial enterprises, for instance, Esri is a, a, a producer of uh, uh, software for geographic uh, applications. They actually um, download the uh, a couple of the key registers convert them to their own uh, 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 format and then re-service them as, as open data so it's it's more a tool for them to service their own clients if we talk about the barriers that were mentioned most often well of course findability of local government especially of local government data they were talk there were uh, concerns about the structure of the data, machine to machine processability, data were not always up to date, detail level too aggregated, um, and especially the fragmented supply. And, and what I mean is that some local government agencies actually 
supply some open data, but other local agencies do not, other local governments do not. So if you want to get some sort of regional or land covering data set, there's gaps in them everywhere. Um, and that's what they mean by uh, fragmented supply. And also they were talking about file formats. Some of the file formats were very complex or the size was too large. Um, and what they also mentioned was that metadata or documentation was lacking, which, which meant that they couldn't really work out what the data was about. And what was also mentioned quite a number of times was long term availability, uncertainty about long term availability. Um, <clears throat> We asked open data reusers to prioritize these barriers, you know, which do you think is the most important one? Uh, and actually what came out was the scattered data or that there's no central location for, for local government data, but also the lack of standardization between uh, local of government data because they use different classifications uh, for similar data sets. That makes it very difficult for reusers to use the data. Uh, when we talked about the needs of open data users, they said, well, please give us multiple file formats. Some actually prefer open formats, other ones want proprietary formats because they use, for instance, they use the Esri software or they want a document in Word or in Excel and not in an open format. Um, they said, please give us multiple data services. Some prefer APIs, some want data dumps, some want downloads. But what a lot of especially the, the um, uh, startups mentioned is show and also the citizens they said shows a sample of the data set so we can assess whether we can use it or not because now we have to download the data set before we can assess whether we can actually use it georeferencing was was often mentioned as a problem georeferencing incorrect or missing or whatever and they said please make data of local governments available via one central platform and use persistent identifiers, nothing as irritating as URLs that change every year. Um, but also they said it's very important for public sector organizations to have good data governance, get the structure uh, standardized, get the metadata in order, but have someone within the organization, whether it's a, a chief data uh, officer or, or whatever, have one within the organization where you can post your questions because now quite often we walk into a wall of people who don't know what the right answer is. Um, the suggestions, of course, they very much reflect the barriers they run into. Um, one suggestion which I thought was interesting is um, make data with a higher level of detail available via APIs. They so that you only get part of the data instead of the whole data set. Um, it, this would sort of alleviate the fact that because of the G, uh, because of uh, the GDPR uh, data being over aggregated, uh, now we can get more level of detail. Of course, that wouldn't stop users from scraping the data set. It's a nice suggestion. It's not going to work in practice. Uh, but what they also mentioned is maybe we should get binding agreements with all levels of government and public enterprises, which data sets should be available and which ones should not. Should also be mentioned that this research was carried out in 2019 before actually the uh, European uh, data strategy was published, where this is also being addressed. Um, and also should mention that the Open Data Directive of 2019 had not been adopted yet. Um, they want more feedback. Uh, they want more, more reaction to the to if they if reusers supply feedback, they want a reaction, a timely reaction. But also that there are easy reporting facilities. A number of reusers said, "Give us a big red button where we can press if we have a question," because now we have to look for a link to send an email or whatever, and also communicate the errors with other users. But what I said is, if you want to know how data is being reused, come and visit us uh, every now and then. Just sit behind us and see how we try to cleanse data and the problems we run into, because we as private sector companies, especially the, the startups, do not have the time to go to um, user meetings or to other meetings we have to earn a living so please come to us we don't want to come to you 
Um, but as I said, it's um, what we need to do is, is improve the findability of data, especially for non-expert users, but this uh, and also improve data governance. But what they also mentioned is thinking societal challenges and, and consider which data would suit the solution. Uh, so create ecosystems where uh, per challenge stakeholders can step in and then step out again. Uh, we don't want uh, long term commitment because again, we only have limited time. Um, some actions were taken after this report. I must admit it's one of the few reports that actually had an effect. Um, the data communities were set up via data.overhead.nl. They already organized open data user meetings quarterly, but they've, they've uh, changed their focus a little bit and also tried to get some more people uh, from, from other communities. The communities they set up within data.overhead.nl, it says here on the website seven communities. In effect, it's five, but two of them are bilingual. So they have an English version and a Dutch version. I'm a member of one of the um, communities <coughs> and they are used for posting questions, asking if certain data sets are available, uh, do other people have problems, etc. Uh, so that part works well, but what doesn't work well is that uh, the person who hosted these data communities within data.overheid.nl has actually left the, the public sector uh, about six months ago. And since then, you notice that we haven't had any user meetings anymore. Uh, so these things, they are a success as long as we have a champion available within the organization. As soon as this person leaves and is not replaced by a similar enthusiastic person, uh, they just cease to exist. And it's a shame because you know, even during Corona period, we had regular meetings that were interesting, and now we haven't had a meeting for six months. <coughs> what we've seen is um, from what's happened since 2019 is that you see a very strong shift from open data as a goal towards a means towards digital transformation. And what you also see is a shift from portals where data are just being uh, offered to more data platforms, which are more interactive. And maybe some anticipation of upcoming EU legislation, although I doubt whether that's actually in the back of the head or whether they're just following the same track. Um, and during 2021, as part of the Twinning Open Data Data Project, which is the to-do project, which is one of the three projects I'm involved in, we actually held six online knowledge exchange meetings with open data organizations that are all in different phases of the open data life cycle. And it really, what you see from these meetings, that there is really a shift from open data uh, as a goal to open data as part of a larger data ecosystem. So that's the big shift you see. Uh, one example, for instance, is the National Road uh, Traffic Data Portal in the Netherlands, <coughs> where you see a number of, of uh, government organizations on local level and on national level uh, acting as data suppliers. But to improve the data quality, there, is also, there are also uh, agreements with 11 market parties through what they call data for data services uh, or data for, for services agreements, uh, which are used to enhance data quality. For instance, uh, TomTom Tom supplies uh, a floating car data to the National Road Traffic Data Portal. The data is then anonymized, but it's used to improve the quality of the data for, in terms of real uh, time uh, traffic information. Um, so it's it's um, republished in the open data, but you cannot actually extract the floating car data. Frederic, um, can I ask you to yeah, to I'll speed up. Go go towards uh, a wrap up. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, it, this is an example of a hybrid platform. Um, for instance, where, where you see that there is a, um, we're going from moving from an open data platform towards more data spaces where uh, there, there are hybrid forms. I'll skip the UK um, and Estonia. Um, a couple of the common issues that were raised during the meetings is trust. How do we deal with 
uh, trust when we also have a lack of resources? And how do we increase digital skills and data literacy? These were really common themes that were coming up. Um, this I'll skip as well. Uh, and of course, we have a number of um, strategies coming up, so we cannot sit still. We have the EU data strategy, uh, which is very, very ambitious, uh, which means that uh, data is, is uh, no longer uh, primarily for, for government to business, but also for business to business, uh, business to government, and most importantly, government to government. So, and it's also linked to the Green Deal and the expectations are high. I'm, I'm very, I doubt very much whether they'll reach it, but there's more to come. Um, they, these are the, the uh, acts that are being negotiated of regulations and they will have a significant impact on open data and protection of personal data, especially in light of the data spaces and the rights of individuals. So, and also this not notion in those acts of the data altruism in the data governance acts will need a lot of negotiation. So if we want to move from only reuse of public sector information to sharing and reusing private sector data as well, uh, we still have a long way to go. So public sector is going to be extremely busy in the next 10 years or so. So if it was simple, I wouldn't have nothing to research. So thank you very much. OK, thank you, Frederica. Um, I, I take the, the opportunity to, to ask you a, a quick question. You did yep. mention that uh, in your research, the largest part of reusers you identified were government uh, reusers, and you actually managed to identify them on a uh, very precise uh, basis, so really at the organizational level. So how did you do that? Because I think that's also relevant for the audience here to know how do you identify the users and know who they are. Did they need accounts or did you identify these government uh, reusers in a different way? We use the log file analysis. In the log file analysis, there are IP numbers. Uh, and in the IP numbers, you can then look them up in tables, uh, which show which organizations, which companies are linked to the IP number. And if you quite often in the domain name, there will be the name of the organization. So that way you can identify users. That's why log file analysis is very, it, it is, um, uh, it's not so much, it, it, it's not so much time consuming, but it takes a lot of effort because they are very, very personal data. So before you can, we as, as the university, we had to sign lots of agreements saying that we uh, would not uh, do anything with the data and destroy the data afterwards. But uh, the organizations who have their own long file data can also do their own um, analysis. And I believe that since we've done this, this research, both Cadastra as well as CBS actually use our methodology to do their, their own research because we shared our methodology with them. OK, thanks a lot. Um, now I would like to uh, invite our next uh, speaker, uh, Antonin, to tell us about uh, the, the French uh, experience and how you approach the, the reusers from the public sector. Yes, it's a pleasure. Can you hear me? Can you see the screen, my slides? Yes, I can. Yeah, great. But I can only see them in the uh, uh, not in a in a presenter mode, just in uh, uh, edit mode. On to me, it's, it looks now? fine. Yes, yeah. okay. it's perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for those uh, two very interesting presentation. I think uh, a lot of thing I'm going to say is going to resonate with what you both said. 
So I will talk a bit about uh, how uh, we measure data demand and uh, reuse in the public sector in France, in particular on the national platform, which is uh, data.gouv.fr. I will talk a bit about how we try to foster uh, data reuse in the public sector. How do you, we measure the, the demand for that data? and how do we measure the usage. And then I'm going to go over uh, some use cases to illustrate uh, actual uh, data reuse from the public sector. Uh, so just a quick word uh, on Etelab, uh, which is the organization I represent today. Uh, it is basically the chief data officer of the French state. Uh, we work on different issues such as data opening and data circulation. Uh, to this end, we uh, provide different uh, services and products such as uh, data.gouv.fr, so the French National Open Data Portal. We have also api.gouv.fr, which is a portal referencing all the public API. Uh, both uh, open API, uh, open data API, and uh, API that uh, need uh, authentication, uh, such as uh, financial data, for example. So it's the, the other parts of uh, data circulation within uh, public services. Uh, then we also do data exploitation, data science, artificial intelligence, and try to foster the usage uh, through uh, public bodies in general. And one of our main mission is to uh, encourage innovation and openness uh, within a public action through programs such as public interest entrepreneur, for example. So how we try to foster data reuse in the public sector? Um, well, uh, I will go over a few uh, aspects that uh, concern not only uh, public sector, but how we foster data reuse in general, because for most parts, uh, we don't do any uh, uh, specific difference. Uh, first of all, we don't do discrimination between users. Uh, what I mean by that is that on the platform, there is no strict distinction between public bodies and any other users in general. Uh, anyone can publish a data set, anyone can publish reuses. Um, it's, I think it's a pretty different approach for most, uh, uh, most of our counterparts. So everyone is welcome to publish and we don't do any moderation before publication. Uh, you can right now, uh, publish something on a platform and moderation is going to be uh, post the publication. Uh, well, on one of the main issue and you, you mentioned it already on the on the data reuse is to make data findable, data discoverable. So um, there is a lot of uh, topics on this uh, subject. But uh, just to name a few examples, uh, lately we worked a lot on, on this aspect by uh, trying to better off the search experience on the platform, especially to um, uh, better off the search engine. Uh, we also work on editorial aspect to provide a relevant data set to users. We are currently working on more a uh, complex uh, definition of uh, what is a popular or what is a trending data set to always uh, showcase the data set and enable um, users to find a uh, relevant data set. Another issue you, you already mentioned is uh, the, the importance of data quality, uh, which is uh, one, of, one of the key aspects of uh, reusability of open data, of course. Uh, here again, there are a lot of things to say on the matter, but I just uh, choose uh, two examples here. Uh, we try to encourage as much as possible the use of uh, data schemas by uh, data producers. Uh, we provide uh, tools uh, to build schemas 
and to validate your data according to schemas. Uh, we also work a lot on fostering metadata quality uh, through, for example, uh, to, we are currently working on implementing a quality scoring on data sets to uh, really enable reusers to identify quickly if this uh, data set is usable or not and for data producers to help them to uh, better off the, the their metadata quality and just to give them good examples on how they can improve the quality of their data. Another key aspect uh, together with discoverability and quality is how you foster exchanges between stakeholder in particular how do you foster exchange between producers and reusers uh, this can be done through portal filters of course discussion community resource reuse uh, you talked about a big red button to give feedbacks so this is uh, th those kinds of um, features are very important but there is also work, uh, as you said, uh, also of uh, community animation. It can go through events, hackathons, etc. But more, more generally, try to get people together, both uh, virtually and and uh, in situ. Um, more generally, on this uh, matter, I'll say it's important to simplify uh, data reuses onboarding and it go also goes for data producers as well. Uh, we noticed that we display a lot of uh, resources. We have guides, we have documentation, sometimes uh, very in-depth resources, but the, 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 the tricky uh, thing is to display the right resource at the relevant moment. You, you cannot just uh, give uh, a lot of resource and expect the data resources to read it all and then uh, um, download the data. You have to give the right resource at the right time. So we really try to understand our users and build a user story and user journey to, to better of their experience in general and, um, and give them the right resource and identify uh, maybe which resources we are lacking, for example. So now a few words on how we measure uh, data demand. Uh, first of all, I need to say that we have, um, within our team, we have uh, two main parts. We have the product and technical team, and we have what we call a, a support team that really the, the main goal is to really empower producers on the publication of the data. They do a lot of uh, data literacy. They provide technical and legal support to uh, producers. Uh, they, are, they act as a proactive team uh, that both answers uh, that are data producers demand, but also works in, uh, on specific thematics and identifies themselves uh, impactful data sets that need to be opened, for example. And uh, this was the, 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 this is the main approach. But we, we realize now that we need to um, go further by n not only empower, uh, empower uh, producer on the publication, but empower them on how to measure usage and data demand. What we realize is that within our strategy, it, it is not possible for us to really, uh, uh, as it is not possible to, for us to uh, check every quality of every organization, uh, we have to uh, empower producers on the publication. Is the same with uh, measuring usage and data demand. We can provide tools. We can uh, do it. Do some research on the portal in general, but it. The, 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 more, the most relevant uh, stakeholders to measure usage and to respond to feedback, etc., are the producers themselves. So we try to empower now producers, uh, I, I will say further on the data life circle to understand, 
understand the needs of the users to provide them resources on how to interpret metrics, uh, resources on how to animate your, um, your community, etc. Uh, I would also like to share uh, some of our struggles, uh, especially on user supports. Um, we have made a lot of efforts to uh, identify and discriminate uh, the demands we receive on uh, the platform support and try to get the, as uh, qualified requests as we can. But I have to admit that to, to, as of today, we do not have find uh, uh, the right solution. We provide uh, frequently answered questions. We provide, uh, we try to discriminate, as I say, a uh, user, but we still receive a lot, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of unqualified requests. Uh, from 10 to 50 a day, uh, people asking for their driver license, people asking for the building permits or any kind of uh, just administ administration demands in general. Uh, I think it's maybe uh, because we are present in every public website footer and sometimes there is a misconception when people uh, come from Google and they they, they come on, on a data sets on a, and COVID data issues, for example, that then they ask question about the how can they get a vaccine or something like this, or how can they be tested? And, and this is just not on on our behalf. So it's it's really hard really to at least for us to give good user supports with limited resources and to receive uh, actual the uh, like qualified demand uh, because we have way too too many demand demands and as, as you said uh, in general public bodies uh, contact us directly uh, because they we already have been in contact and when uh, public sector reusers also most of the time, as you said, uh, know who is produce, producing the data and this is a big advantage for us because the administration uh, is sometimes very complicated and it's not it's not uh, obvious which uh, which organization produce what, but most of the time they 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 know uh, who to speak to. And yeah, now we're going to talk about how to measure usage. Well, the first, the first thing, uh, whatever the type of user is, is to understand the user. Uh, who are they? What are they doing and why? How do they use portal? What are the frustration and needs? Uh, there's different methods we use to measure usage in general. Uh, we use quantitative methods, uh, the portal metrics, uh, surveys, etc. Uh, we also do qualitative methods, and for which are in general more uh, more accurate. We do a lot of user interviews, uh, and we also do editorial use cases to really go in depth in use cases that we find impactful, meaningful for uh, for open data and that can inspire both producer to to show how how their data is useful and for reusers to inspire them to what they can do with open data. So this is um, one of the way we we try to measure and showcase usage. In general, we try to set uh, the relevant indicators. Uh, there is a strong need to establish uh, relevant qualitative impact indicators on issues such as data discoverability and data quality. Uh, by such indicators, I mean uh, much more precise indicators like KPI, uh, for example, when we work on a uh, data preview, uh, we're going to try to track the mean time spent on data preview, for example. So this is the uh, indicators that aims to 
uh, address and understand uh, a specific functionality or a very specific issue. And this goes all together with uh, the quality metrics, the quantity and the, the quantity metrics and all these together um, enables us to to measure the, the impact of uh, what we're doing. Uh, I'll say the, that we try to be as much as possible uh, be aware of uh, vanity metrics, uh, such as the number of data set, the number of free uses, the number of uh, visits, or even the number of uh, download that most of the time don't really give, uh, it can give some kind of information, but at least for our portal, it doesn't give a, a, a true measure to impact. Uh, for example, if we have a lot of visits, it can be only because people are just lost on our website and they wanted to have information, but no, no raw data, for example. So we did not uh, better off the 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 answer to the public. It's just people are just lost on the website, for example. So those metrics are, um, are tricky to interpret. Uh, one of our main way to measure usage. Uh, it's of course the the functionality to reference uh, data reuse. So anyone has data sets, anyone can publish data reuse on the portal. Um, we believe this is uh, critical to information to the public uh, because we mostly uh, provide raw data. So the the, the means uh, through uh, through which. Uh, users find information on our portal are through uh, the reuse. It is of course uh, very important to measure impacts of um, of the the openness of data and it also encourages discussion uh, to um, producers to reusers because producers are much more eager to answer to to feedbacks when they they know uh, what their data are used for. And um, yeah, so uh, public bodies doesn't really identify themselves as uh, reusers. And I think here we have maybe a problem of uh, wording of or maybe a definition. And we try to incentive them to publish both uh, reuse on data sets from other organization but also on their own data set too, because most of the time when they publish, they publish a data set, they always, uh, they already have some kind of data visualization, interpretation, etc. Uh, so we try to incentive, uh, incentivize them to, to publish. I saw in the, in the paper that uh, you mentioned the uh, Région Centre Val de Loire that uh, actually published a reuse on the national COVID data. Uh, I was uh, very happy to see that because it, it really shows, I think, how uh, the fact that we promote uh, reuse referencing helps to understand uh, who use data and what for. Uh, very recently, like two days ago, uh, we have the National uh, uh, Statistics Institute, the INSEE, that publish a reuse on the Ministry of Interior that data on crime. Uh, this is a very interesting example for us uh, because those are two institutions that um, have their own uh, vision on open data and uh, it just shows that more and more uh, public bodies uh, um, invest in referencing their, their reuse. Uh, now uh, I will give some example on use cases that I hope you'll find uh, interesting. Uh, the first uh, example I wanted to talk about are public services, uh, digital public services uh, that produce, exploit and distribute uh, data. I call them uh, open data by design uh, because I think uh, for those services, the fact to produce and distribute the data 
is uh, as important as the actual service they provide in their value proposition. Uh, for example, Accès Libre uh, gather information and maps information on the accessibility of establishment open to the public. Uh, we have Camino that opens the data of the mining domain also and also provide a cartography to uh, a map a mapping of those data. Uh, we have uh, Datagir that developed uh, different simulators to evaluate the environmental impact of our behavior. We have uh, simulators on, on food consumption, on uh, mobility, etc. And also, of course, all those data are available to to be uh, reinterpreted, incorporated to uh, other system, compared, etc. Um, another good example, and uh, you mentioned it for the, the the Danish example, I think is the um, national address database. The national address database is part of uh, what we call in France the service public de la donnée, the uh, data public services, uh, which concerns nine data sets that are um, recognized by law as uh, very important for the good, uh, the good the good work of the state and uh, the country in general. So we have, uh, for example, the National Address Database that is used in many private and public application, uh, for example, to provide autocomplete when you type your address and you get uh, you get the results automatically. It's a facilitate broadband network installation for both private and public actors, but is also used to uh, for emergency services as you mentioned for the for the Danish example, to locate five factor response more accurately. Another example of uh, such data set is the Repertory of Entreprise, the base Siret uh, Sirene, uh, which is a data set uh, referencing all French companies and on which uh, different public services uh, um, are based on to, to provide uh, services. You have uh, Signal Conso that allows consumers to report uh, uh, consumption anomalies. You have Signal Faible uh, that uh, facilitate the targeting of uh, government remedial action towards company in difficulty. Uh, or Annuaire des Entreprises, which is a website where you can find all public information concerning French company. All those three uh, services uh, are based on the on the same cornerstone, which is the this uh, data set of repertory of enterprise. So that's it for my examples, and I'll be uh, very glad to answer your question if you have any. OK, thank you very much, uh, Antonin, for this very rich uh, presentation. Um, actually, yes, please go ahead with the, with the applause. I see it's coming up here. Really nice. Um, I see a question uh, coming up in the chat. So actually, I would like to invite uh, Samir El Tagaduni, apologies if I pronounce it wrong, to unmute yourself and uh, show your camera and ask your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Charlotte. Uh, thank you, uh, Antonin, for the for the presentation. And I was interested in your um, the, the the slide where you mentioned uh, the, the the importance of uh, let's say measuring the usefulness or the success of an open data initiative, and uh, you uh, refer to uh, beware of of vanity uh, metrics, which I found a nice um, slide, and you refer you refer indeed to to visits, which um, uh, don't um, maybe tell the whole uh, story of how um, how good the experience is for the for the visitor or the user of the of the service. And so I wondered if you had already some reflection on what might be uh, better um, uh, metrics to consider. Um, so uh, and maybe I, I should present myself first. And, and don't worry, Charlotte, for your name. I think it was uh, already massacred a couple of times before you. Um, 
So I, I work in, in uh, DG Agri uh, for the European Commission, and we work on, on uh, the AgriFood data portal, which you mentioned, uh, Charlotte, uh, in, um, at the start of your uh, um, uh, presentation or, or intervention. And so we have a couple of metrics that we follow, like visits, durations, the number of clicks, but we'd be really curious uh, to know if you have maybe other um, better, uh, let's say, metrics to recommend. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this question. Um, well, for, first of all, why are they particularly ver vanity metrics for our portal? Is that, as I said, we have a lot of traffic uh, coming from users that are not uh, data reusers or data producers. We, I think it, we are one of the only portal in Europe where we actually have a lot of traffic for various reasons. Most of the time it's because we display a lot of reuses. People come from uh, from Google, from all the services. They're just uh, looking for uh, COVID-19 uh, days death uh, statistic, for example, and they're ending up on the on the portal. So we have uh, millions of visits, which uh, and a lot of them are unqualified uh, visitors, uh, at least with what we we give uh, today as services uh, and the other answer is the regarding what uh, kpi to use uh, it's uh, as i said we we try to narrow it down now to uh, more specific issues for example we are working on the different thematics uh, the last uh, three, four months was uh, data discoverability. So we tried to identify the the main indicator is those user find what they are looking for. But if you can just you can then narrow it down even more, even further to say those user use actually uh, tags, for example, to search that data set. Uh, as I say, in quality, we you can we are currently working on um, data scoring for datasets, for example. Uh, we're going to have uh, two main uh, way to measure the usefulness of these metrics. You can uh, calculate the metadata quality. Uh, before and the metadata quality of the catalogs uh, after, but you can also uh, try to actually do interviews with producers to the, to see does that helps you to uh, provide a better data metadata quality. You can do interviews with uh, reusers to ask them if these indicators actually help them to uh, to identify which data set they are going to use. Uh, so th those are just a few examples, but I think uh, we, we, we doesn't, we, at least we haven't found uh, a right indicators for everything that we can just uh, uh, watch it uh, uh, evolve. We try to really narrow it down to different indicators on very specific issues and this together with uh, interviews, together with uh, other general metrics, uh, gives us a big pictures of uh, of uh, our impacts on the on the platform and on on the users. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, uh, just to, to to see if you had some other, let's say, uh, a ready-made metric of it, or if it was more like a qualitative um, uh, deep dive. So that certainly answers the question. And sorry, I just noticed on the camera uh, because of the backlighting, you don't see much of my face. I look like someone in the witness protection program. But uh, okay, yeah. Apologies for that. Uh, thanks a lot, Antonin. You're welcome. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Samir, for this question. And uh, if I understand your answer correctly, Antonin, I, um, if I, I hear you say that it's important to actually have a mix of quantitative measures and qualitative ones to to actually validate the the, the quantitative insights. Uh, that you gather. So please correct me uh, 
if I'm wrong in interpreting it so. Oh, you're still muted, Antonin. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's completely. Uh, I'll try to give an example. Um, uh, for for ex for example, lately we watch uh, the stats and we notice that uh, actually very few people use the search engine like the internal search engine on the platform. So, but how can you know if people don't use it because it doesn't work well? Or how can you know if they don't use it because, uh, well, most of the time they use Google and they just find that data sets and they, are, they don't need an internal uh, search engine or they can go through uh, organization and find that data set. Uh, you have to, to use the metrics, um, the quantitative metrics to understand the problem and to see after after the new search engines if the the research has changed but you also need the quant qualitative metrics interviews to understand what are the actual uh, user journey on the platform when uh, looking for data sets great thanks uh, i would also like to give uh, frederica the opportunity to uh, react to this point of the vanity statistics and how to deal with it. How do we really measure the, the demand of the of the public sector reusers? Uh, and in the meantime, I'd like to ask uh, Antonio Salvador Filograna to prepare himself to uh, ask his question uh, to Frederica after uh, this first point. Please go ahead, Frederica. Yeah, in terms of uh, the vanity uh, metrics, I totally agree with you, Antoine. Um, but because um, as we found in our research, uh, number of hits doesn't actually say anything about the, the usability of, of a portal or what the data being used for. That's what you need to delve deeper into the, the metrics. Uh, however, it is important to measure at least the number of hits if you're talking about the capacity or the, the, the um, storage capacity you need for your platform because <clears throat> for instance PDOK website is accessed a lot of times as you've seen by the metrics it's basically because a lot of the a lot of the data they use is being used in other services so every time when you access another service you also hit um, the PDOK server. So you do need to have some idea of the number of hits to know the, the capacity of the ser your server capacity because you, you need to have it in a user friendly way. But it is apart from that number of hits doesn't mean anything at all. It uh, do users use it once and then move away. Do they, as you say, keep on clicking because they can't find what they're looking for. Um, it doesn't mean so. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think what you're doing with doing the, the interviews probably tells you more, but it's also more time consuming. But it is in the end probably the only way. Um, unless you're going to use other tools like uh, eye tracking devices in, in pilot groups. OK, thank you for this, Frederica. Um, Antonio Salvatore Filograna also posted a question in the chat uh, to you, Frederica. Mm -hmm. uh, Antonio, could you unmute yourself and present yourself quickly and ask her a question? Hello to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, just a quick question. Do you know uh, how the data were reused and for uh, what purpose? For all types of purposes. Um, as I said before, uh, we found that uh, commercial companies were using the data either to produce new products and services or to improve their internal um, uh, way that they do the business, so for internal business processes. Um, they uh, use uh, also NGOs do the same thing. 
either for internal business processes or to produce uh, uh, societal services. And we also found a lot of citizens doing exactly the same thing. So what you see is you see a lot of overlap. Um, as you, you, the different categories of users are using data for similar purposes. Um, namely either for their internal processes, for, for efficiency reasons, if, or for effectiveness reasons, uh, or to produce new products, new apps, whether that's for profit or not. Uh, and what we saw with the private sector users, they actually just reuse a lot of the, the data, uh, and which was mentioned also a number of times without actually being aware that they're reusing it. So they don't see themselves as being a reuser of the data, but they use it a lot of the time. Uh, we, for instance, uh, we find that um, uh, an organization like Cadaster, a lot of the, the employees actually reuse uh, Cadaster data through an open data platform rather than trying to find it internally in, on their own servers because, uh, because it just saves them time. So it's um, it, it's for all types of purposes. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. OK, thanks, Frederica. So this actually leads me to a point uh, made by Antonin during his presentation, because I hear you say that a lot of public sector reusers aren't conscious open data reusers. They simply look for some data and use it in their work. But then again, to advance uh, the, the awareness about this type of use and well, spread the word, so to say, Antoine made the point that it's important to share reuse cases and to incentivize uh, these, these organizations uh, for that purpose. So uh, I was curious to hear from you, uh, Antoine, in how, how do you go about providing the incentives to, to the organizations? and while well, making sure that while well, they become conscious uh, open data reusers and, and share uh, this experience. Well, um, for me, there is different kind of uh, implication. Um, and I, I didn't mention it in my uh, presentation, but there are also, uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Frederica, as there are lots of organization, especially local organization, that don't necessarily have the mean to exploit uh, and visualize their own data and national open data, but they they have uh, private services that helps them to have like a dashboard of the city. Um, something is just internal, so they are actually using open data. Uh, for uh, public policy steering, for uh, the, the the general policies of the of the local organization, but through uh, a private organization that provide them helps uh, on how to exploit data. Uh, regarding administration that uh, and public bodies in general that are uh, that are reusers themselves. Uh, I think it's more much more problem of uh, vocabulary because the for in, in general we identify uh, that our users are as uh, people from uh, stakeholders coming from outside uh, the administration so they they, they don't I, I, I don't I think they don't feel uh, parts of uh, this movement of referencing their work etc because it's not uh, they don't feel addressed in this way. So just uh, the when you discussed uh, with the producers that open that to help them to open a data set, uh, we try to mention, but you also provide services on these data sets, uh, publish those results. This will bring uh, information to the public, but also most of the time bring you a lot of traffic on your own website. Uh, because we are uh, we benefit from a lot of traffic on our portal on our platform it can also be an incentive to public bodies like uh, local public bodies for example they can get a lot of uh, visit to their platform or to their uh, visualization to their research uh, thanks to to all our point of entry 
So the main the main incentive is just give information and get traffic and it's, uh, help open data, which are basically the same incentive we try to use uh, for the public sector. A private sector, sir. OK, thank you, Antonin. Uh, I see we also have a question from uh, Maria Claudia Bodino from um, the Directorate of Informatics. Yeah. So Maria Claudia, can I ask you to unmute and show your camera and ask uh, your questions? Yes, thanks, uh, Charlotte. My camera is not working. Sorry for that. <laughs> but uh, basically, um, first of all, thanks for your presentation. They are were really interesting. And um, I'm currently working for Digit, but before I spent many years working on open data, ma mainly on open data directive, and also uh, on the data-driven COVID-19 task force in Italy for, for the Italian digital transformation team. And um, during my experience, what I really uh, found very important is that to foster open, open data reuse, you really need to foster a public and private partnership. So basically put data that are public, that are open together with data that are private. And the COVID uh, pandemic was a clear example. No, When you had to control maybe the effect of a lockdown in a country, you had to mix together open data and public data, uh, sorry, and private data. So my question was uh, um, related to the quality aspect of the open data that very often uh, are very the quality is, is not so good in the data set that member states are also publishing for example in the in the european data portal so do you have in place any uh, quality feedback loops uh, antoine uh, antonin sorry to check and also to try to you know to optimize the quality of your open data that you are offering. Um, I, I was also looking to the API portal. It, it's really it's interesting because it goes in the direction of the open data directive. So my question is, do you have in place some uh, um, project that are uh, uh, looking at the quality of the data, how to check the quality, how to also provide feedback to the data producer to, to improve them? And if you, if yes, if you can share some uh, repository or some resources, thank you. Yes, uh, maybe I can just give me one second so I can share the screen. Um, so yes, on regarding the issue on uh, mixing private with uh, public data, I would say that we are not uh, very mature on this point. Uh, uh, expect from uh, APIs uh, where public APIs that uh, rest, um, restricted habilitation uh, to public APIs uh, on the national open data platform. Uh, we try to, we, it's not It's not a, an aspect we really try to tackle. Um, we don't have a like a data lake or a perspective or something like this. But regarding data quality, there are many different initiatives. Uh, one of them is the data schemas. So this is the platform where we, um, where you can find all the data schemas on the, uh, regarding open data. Those are those are data schemas uh, built uh, within uh, the community, and they have al always discussion on schemas. You have on the trees, on a lot of um, schemas uh, concern. Uh, local uh, data sets so the, the the main goal is for example to have a, uh, every municipality every uh, every town in france needs to publish their um, uh, data on the trees uh, we want uh, schemas that en enables us to 
have the same um, the same data sets as throughout all the local publication. Here you have the adopt, publish, and construction, and then those uh, those um, schemas uh, together with our schemas we provide tools to publish uh, open data according to schemas that helps you to uh, here I want to publish um, uh, electric car uh, re recharge spot uh, which is a very important data set and it is going to help me uh, fill the data sets uh, this is not a good demonstration because I did not uh, prepare anything, but you can uh, you you can upload your data set. You can also uh, uh, fill it online, and then you can uh, check for the data set if it works or not, and then publish the data set. And uh, for example, uh, on this that the these schemas. Uh, you have uh, 375 uh, different data sets that respect uh, this schema and that enables us to build. Uh, so th those those are all data sets from various organizations, a private organization that publish uh, data sets on according to the schemas. You can see there is uh, Tesla, etc. You can have uh, Auto, uh, Burger King, and whatnot. And this helps us afterwards to build automatically um, a file with uh, together with all those data sets that uh, respect the schemas. Uh, so here you have the 375 uh, data set in uh, one uh, specific uh, data set that uh, respect uh, the the, um, the schemas so this is one of the um, one of the way uh, we work on data quality but we are currently working on on the the this is we, we work by uh, thematics so we were working on this data discoverability and now we are uh, special especially sorry focused on data quality, so you can see on our backlog there a lot of subject on data schemas, but also a lot of issues on um, uh, metadata quality, uh, pre, uh, pre visualization, as I said, and other the the, the issues of uh, giving a quality scoring to a data sets, uh, a lot of different uh, issues. Thank you. Very interesting. Last question. How big is your team that is currently working on all of this topic? Um, it's around 10 people within the team, uh, together with the product team and uh, what we call the support team, which is uh, approximately three people. So like seven for product slash uh, uh, technical issues and three approximately for support and empowering the, the producers. Thank you, thank you. Great job. Thank you. OK, before we move to uh, a wrap up, I'd like to also quickly give the floor to Grace Milne uh, from the Lisbon Council because she posted a very relevant question uh, for both of our speakers, I would say. So Grace, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. OK, perfect. Yeah, so just thanks to everyone. It was a very interesting webinar. And I was just wondering um, if I could hear a bit more about some of the engagement activities to find out the concrete needs of data reusers, because you know, we've heard a lot about the challenges. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to hear about what activities can be done to actually reach out and find what these people need. And my question could go to anyone, anyone who would like to answer. Ms. Frederica, perhaps? Sorry, can you just uh, repeat your question? There's, uh, it was just a truck passing by. Now that you gave me. 
<laughs> yeah, no, of course. Yeah, I was just wondering um, if I could hear a bit more about the, enga the engagement activities. So to work with people, the public sector data reusers to find out yeah, what they need to support them in their journey. What I actually found is uh, when we were still having the open data user meetings with the uh, Ministry of the Interior here in the Netherlands, most of the participants were actually a public sector from public sector organizations, so very few from the private sector. And what I found worked very, very effectively was the, the drinks afterwards. Uh, the drink session afterwards, which I really I, I mean, I don't drink alcohol myself, so it's it's uh, but I used it to uh, uh, get a lot of of informal information. And I think that works well uh, to, to get informal settings. People are more willing to talk in informal settings than you, you do in formal settings. So just to give a quick. Uh... Uh, anecdote on this, um, we noticed uh, on bro when browsing on all the reuse, we have like uh, 3000 reuses on the national platform uh, that the, the types of users are um, very specific. Most of the time it's uh, um, uh, people that are uh, very convinced on how uh, why open data is useful and most of them are um, uh, individuals and we noticed this way that uh, actually people that goes the extra miles to reference uh, their work are a very specific types of uh, users uh, so we identify uh, different uh, thematics and different types of users and we try to reach out to uh, users that we are not uh, particularly used to talk to. Uh, for example, in our organization, there's a, I think a, a culture that is much more close to civil society rather than uh, private uh, businesses. But we need to understand the needs of private businesses because there are different needs in terms of disponibility, in terms of accessibility, in terms of usage uh, than uh, civil society. They don't use the same data set as well. Uh, so we try to identify uh, different uh, thematics like health and mobility, etc., and different types of uh, users. And then we try to fill the gap when we are lacking information on something. And then we, we tr just uh, reach people out, like uh, see uh, on, tic on Twitter, on uh, website. We when we notice uh, that I reuse, we say that oh, that might be made with open data, and then we try to reach out to those people. Great, thank yeah, you. That's so what much. we did as well with our scraping exercise when we scraped uh, the internet uh, to find applications of uh, reusing open data. We we had a, a script scraped websites and that was very useful for um, finding cases. Okay, so I'm afraid we've come to the to the time we have today for our webinar. So. I would like to share with you some final points. First of all, for those who know the Data.Europa Academy, you know it's important uh, for us to, to receive your uh, feedback on today's uh, webinar, uh, the, if it met your, your expectations, if you may have any other uh, types of feedback uh, for us. And uh, I believe the link also to the feedback form will be pasted in the chat. Um, then this webinar is not uh, self-standing. It's a uh, part of a, of a whole campaign starting with the discussion paper, but it will be followed up with uh, blogs on data.europa.eu. So please keep an eye on that. And. Uh, um, in next year, we will follow up with a concluding paper on fostering data-driven value creation in the public sector 
through the insights uh, you provided uh, us uh, today in the, in the discussion. Uh, and also, I would like to draw your attention to the Data.Europa Academy collaboration channel, uh, to which uh, many of you in the audience have received a dedicated invitation. So this is really for open data representatives only to continue the discussion on, uh, well, how to shape the, the open data practices in your country and move also towards a more demand driven uh, data publication and support. So you can help each other there. Um, also, there are other events uh, coming up, two more uh, webinars, one on citizen generated data and one on the role of data.europa.eu in the context of the EU data spaces. So registry is still very much open for that. And then uh, just leaves me to well, uh, thank you all for, for being here, especially uh, the speakers, Frederica Verle-Donker and Antonin Garon. Many, many thanks uh, for today. Uh, my colleagues at the Lisbon Council and the Data.Europa team, of course, DG Connect and the Publications Office of the European Union, uh, who stand behind all of the Data.Europa EU. Uh, activities. So I wish you a very nice uh, rest of the afternoon and hope to meet you again at the next occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.